everyone for being here. Um, it's really my pleasure to um, be presenting perhaps a bit of a different talk today than what you've seen. Um, so this talk is definitely focusing quite a lot more on the PLAS AI. Um, I actually don't, don't work on Spark, um, but I'm a researcher at uh, DeepMind, which is uh, a company in the Alphabet family. And today I'll describe you a bit of how, as a researcher and as a lead of such a big project uh, throughout a uh, couple of years that we've been working on this, we tackled a pretty challenging problem um, in AI. And also, I'll try to convey how this connects to the overall DeepMind's mission. So perhaps to begin, let me start with um, stating really what DeepMind is about. Um, DeepMind obviously was funded a few years ago, and its goal remains to solve intelligence as part one, or per perhaps as one of the two main components, and the other is to use it to make the world a better place. And both of these actually connect quite strongly to the project I'll be describing um, called Alpha Star, which um, conveys or it tries to build an agent that plays a video game called StarCraft. So let's dive into kind of maybe the trademark uh, really on how um, at DeepMind we are tackling the problem of building complex systems to do complex tasks. And here, perhaps, it's already a bit different to um, the paradigm that we've been hearing about a lot today, which is this, this of uh, data and a data scientist looking at this data. So in reinforcement learning, really, we don't have a data set per se. We have what we call an environment. And um, the, our model would be what we call an agent. And so this agent observes the environment. Of course, the environment could be as complicated as the real world, me coming here, giving a talk, etc. I had to wake up, walk around, and so on. And also, I acted upon this environment, so I send these actions back into the environment. And of course, agents do have goals. These goals could be quite complicated, like surviving in the real world, or they could be a slightly more concrete, um, such as maximizing score or winning at a video game or other things, right? And this paradigm is pretty nice because um, you can actually see the standard data maybe supervised learning paradigm that you might be more used to as a subset of these, where the environment is a data provider and your actions would be, give me a new data sample and you feed your model and so on and so forth. Um, but this paradigm is really powerful and the main um, idea is not to use an agent that perhaps prescribe some rules um, about how to maximize this goal, but to have this agent actually learn. So perhaps the, main, the first and very quite um, famous example and how DeepMind actually was presented to the world was the idea that you could train a neural network that in inputs the observations from the Atari environment, which is obviously a, a set of games that many of us might have played a few hours, um, at least some time ago perhaps, and then this neural network will kind of transform the pixels into an action, into a joystick plus button combination action, so as to maximize the score in any of these 57 or so games that um, this environment provides. And the idea is not to hard code any rules, is to let the neural network weights learn through ingesting all these observation action tuples that we generate as we play the games. So it's, it's a very online sort of way to generate data, if you will. So Atari really is obviously quite um, an old game, and it's not very complicated in many of the axes of complexity that we would like our agents um, to solve in regards to the, their environment. And what I like to say oftentimes is that, like a data set that if it's not complicated or interesting, our models will not be very interesting or our predictions will not be very useful. Like that, um, environments must be challenging and interesting for our agents to become interesting in them. So with this kind of like rational, um, the researchers that nowadays are working on reinforcement learning have proposed and built many such environments to test how algorithms are performing and to obviously develop new research to advance um, AI research. So there are quite a few environments actually that have been proposed um, 
many of which use games, uh, some of which also use kind of simulators of physics, like the one in the uh, bottom right there, which is called Mujoko. And one environment in particular that was deemed quite difficult um, for machine learning to tackle was the board game of Go. And as you might have heard, uh, in 2016, uh, DeepMind built AlphaGo, which was a system that combined search with machine learning in a way that was able to defeat a world champion at the game. And Go, in terms of complexity, had this beautiful aspect that it is multiplayer. So to become very good at the game of Go, you can keep playing against yourself, so the challenge in the environment will remain kind of constant, right? Your win rate against yourself is almost by definition 50%. So Go has this axis of complexity that Atari didn't really have, which is it's a multiplayer game. And also the action space is slightly larger than most Atari games that we played back in the paper that was first published in 2014. So at this, at this point, I actually uh, joined DeepMind uh, from, from Brain, from Google Brain, where I was working mostly on like, machine learning models for language. And we were looking for what could be um, a next challenge for perhaps these agents and environments. So this is where I get to talk to about a game that I also used to play uh, when I was 15 years old. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know, um, so maybe show of hands, have you heard about StarCraft before? Um, okay. Okay, great, great. Um, you guys are smart, okay. Um, all right. Anyways, the, the TLDR of this game, um, when I try to explain it, I map it quite a bit to chess. So StarCraft is a bit like chess, where you start with only a few pieces. You decide which pieces you're going to build or invest in building next. And crucially, you don't get to see the other side of the board. You don't get to observe what the opponent is perhaps doing or preparing for you. And there's also a collection resources paradigm in which you have to deal with economic decisions, such as should I expand more to gather more resources later on? But of course, that incurs the risk of then perhaps being attacked earlier and so on and so forth. And what I like about this game as well is uh, its UI. So in this video, um, this is a first-person camera view of uh, a player playing the game. And you will observe like, all these units going around, but there's basically a mouse where you use to click to command units, to select units, um, to move your camera perspective, and so on and so forth. So this UI, or this action space, really, is quite complex, quite similar to how you deal with when you use your laptop, or perhaps also uh, what you have to do when you use your phone to swipe, and so on and so forth. So the action space is really rich and really interesting. So, as a result, if we put StarCraft in this axis of difficulty, it really provides, um, perhaps more importantly, this aspect of imperfect information. You don't get to know what's happening in the world at all times, unlike Go or chess, for example. And also, the action space is quite vast, because you could consider kind of clicking on all these combination of, combinations of units that you create uh, being essentially combinatorial, which is a pretty large and complex action space. So this ties quite nicely to DeepMind's mission, because first, this is a benchmark of complexity, which allows us to develop and test current algorithms um, towards the goal of solving intelligence. But also, this aspect of sort of action space that really gets into UIs and sort of more real-world, um, complex, combinatorial action spaces gets us more towards real applications, perhaps, than we had before. And also, we're not really the first ones to think of StarCraft as a research domain. So as I was saying before, I actually played the game back in the late 90s. But it turns out that in 2011, um, or 2010 really, we actually at Berkeley um, had a pretty cool project led by uh, Dan Klein and uh, David Hall and David Burkhead, where they tried to build a StarCraft playing bot or agent, mostly based on rules, um, based on sort of, oh, do a lot of these units, and if you're attacked uh, before five minutes, maybe build a defensive um, uh, building and so on and so forth. And that actually won one of these competitions of AIs versus AIs. And one cool thing that happened uh, from that is that a class was set up to teach AI to undergraduates at Berkeley. And this is a slide from that class that Dan uh, taught then in 2011. 
And what I like about this slide is that it sort of says that StarCraft is super challenging for all these listed reasons that um, he had in this slide. But then he had this corollary that no single AI technique can solve possibly playing StarCraft well off the shelf. And looking back, and perhaps that obviously was true at the time, but what we have really kind of are trying to do with this agent environment paradigm is precisely that, right? So this is the architecture, the neural network that inputs observations on the left, issues actions on the right, and has many components, all of which are learned, um, that sort of try to maximize the probability of winning at, in this case, of course, the game of StarCraft. And what I like about this is it has many components that we see in state-of-the-art machine learning um, algorithms or problems such as ResNets for computer vision, transformers, or LSTMs that are widely used in language modeling or machine translation, and so on and so forth. So, but with this architecture alone, we are just essentially able to interact with the game without setting any handcrafted rules and so on and so forth. And just to say it maybe a bit differently, we're really trying to map from an observation that's not quite like the raw pixels, but something close to it, to then this combination of almost API calls into the game engine itself, that would be something like select rectangle, which two points I'm going to use, and so on. All these are created by the neural network. We send these actions to the environment, the environment sends us an observation, and off we go to play this real-time strategy game. So, we started with a slightly simplified version of the game, or very simplified, in which you have two units, and these units have to solve, for instance, in this case, a TSP, time assessment problem, um, very simple, not really, but... Um, so we tried to kind of have these mini-games in the open source release of the environment for other researchers to tackle. And once, um, you know, once we felt that these agent was able to perform this task, in this case of kind of cleaning up the map, um, we felt ready for tackling the one versus one full game of StarCraft. Um, that being said, this is not a very interesting way to play StarCraft, and we had professional players playing this, and we beat them, but I don't think they tried really very hard. Um, and it really is like playing seven minutes of this is not great. You can download this map and play yourself. And tell me your higher score, by the way. I might add you to the leaderboard. So with that um, in mind, we start to try to tackle really the full challenge of StarCraft. And perhaps the non-obvious first step, which is important nonetheless, is how do, are we going to play this game? Right? This is a computer playing a game that usually is played by humans. So you would like to sort of play like a human, kind of equalize the fields as much as you can. But this is quite complicated. There are lots of decisions that we take as players. We look around the screen, lots of, of issues that we face when we play the game, including, for instance, nervousness, right? So modeling all these is quite complicated. And the problem is the current work, because of the agents perhaps were not at the level of professional players yet, really didn't ha set the rules of how do you play in equal grounds with humans. So here on the left, um, you can see a professional player playing the game. And it's really outstanding to see it live, really, or in the videos, how quick, how precise they are with their eye-hand coordination to move the camera and move units around. Um, these humans can perform hundreds of actions per minute or clicks per minute, all of which have to be certainly precise. So you could say, well, OK, let's just create a computer, sort of maybe this funny robotic-looking hand that will try to operate you know, with the same interface that humans play, right? So a keyboard, a mechanical keyboard, and a mouse. And as you probably have seen many times or have heard, the state of robotics is not quite there for us to try to tackle this problem in full, right? So ideally, we would like to have robots sort of interacting as precisely as humans can be, perhaps, but that would be sort of maybe the next challenge would be to play StarCraft, but also creating all sorts of robotic arms. And this, I mean, this was a state of the art three years ago, but I don't think the field has advanced quite as much to perform at the level of the humans, right? So, so anyways, we tried to define some, some parameters of fairness, and um, we iterated a little bit as well since um, the matches in January. So how does it all work, right? Um, this 
the main idea here is to use reinforcement learning, which I was describing before, and it's really simple. Um, you just get a policy or a neural network to issue actions. You play games. First, you play random games. Literally, you play the game just not knowing what you're clicking or what you're doing. And any time you win a game, you then go back and look which actions I thought I was losing, but I end up winning the game, and you reinforce these actions. You say, this is a positive example, so to speak, if you had a supervised data set. And interestingly, as I was saying, this creates a very different paradigm, perhaps, than we're used to in terms of distributed learning. So we have the learner that updates the neural network weights running on uh, a TPU um, in the data centers, and then we have actors that are not just providing data, but they're also running the game and acting on the game all the time. So it's a very kind of online process that perhaps is a new challenge for this kind of community to think about. What if my data source is actually something live that I'm querying on the fly all the time? So we run this at scale, and we let it train for a few days. And what happened was, perhaps obvious in retrospect, um, if the video loads. Um, otherwise, I'll just describe it. This is a fairly simple video. So what happened is the agent took all its workers and said, look, I send these workers to the enemy base. It does something somewhat creative to pull the, work, the enemy workers back and forth a little bit and actually ends up winning the game by just attacking with the workers, which is actually a well-known technique if you really are not trying to play StarCraft. And the problem is, from a random agent standpoint, this really makes sense. You click randomly on the screen, all you're going to do is put your workers out of work, which is not great, except when you send them to the enemy base, in which case your enemy is not that good, and you attack one of its buildings, and you actually might get a reward by winning. Now, this, as I was saying, this is actually playing against the hardest built-in AI that the game has. And so we actually were able to beat, beat all the levels of AIs um, that uh, Blizzard has put in the game. But we really didn't feel we should play against people quite yet with this agent. This was kind of very first steps in the project. So in this ladder of players going from uh, bronze, silver, um, gold, and so on and so forth, up to master and grandmaster level, um, these we claim as unranked. This is not worth probably trying to play against. And we start to see these difficulties of StarCraft. Exploration is very hard. It's very hard to discover units and advanced um, elements of the game by randomly clicking. And many strategies exist, so you end up focusing on improving this worker rush over and over without discovering other aspects, strategic aspects of the game. So what did we do? We use what's called imitation learning, which actually is exactly the same as how you train, for instance, a machine translation system, which I used to do all the time back in Google Brain. You get a big data set of, in this case, games. And given the observations up to time t, you're trying to predict not to win. You're not trying to play to win. You're trying to predict what is the human going to click now. Um, and you get a lot of data that Blizzard um, open sourced. Um, this is actually terabytes of data that anyone can use for sequence modeling. And you, that's all you do. You, you just train the first policy to just imitate humans. And what happens is actually quite reasonable. You get to see sort of a policy that starts to look believable. I mean, it's, it plays the game, it, it, it kind of moves the camera around, it sends units, it expands, it will, it will go attack the enemy. You don't know exactly what it's doing, why it's doing that, but it's imitating humans, and it actually plays at a decent level. It actually beats all the bots and also kind of goes through perhaps median human player um, in terms of performance. So with that in mind, then we went through iterate over self-play. So I'm not going to describe this in great detail, but the main idea is we have this agent, we clone it many, many times, and we let it play against itself, perhaps with different preferences strategically. So at the end of the day, you have essentially maybe hundreds of agents that, that, that initially were copies of, the, of themselves playing each other to win the game. And with that, we actually were able to challenge the best DeepMind players which were at the master level. So the question was, well, can we actually beat people that really care about the game 
um, professional players. So what we did back in December, really, which was announced in January, was we invited two players to come into DeepMind and play a, a bunch of games. And the results were we, we, we beat um, both of them. One was 5-0, although he was playing Protoss, which was not his main race. The other one, we also beat um, Mana, in this case, 5-1. to one. And the way that the agents played, uh, people that watch and understand the game found it interesting, although the issue of fairness came about as well. I mean, some of the agents in this population of hundreds of agents, some of them developed strategies that perhaps went a bit too far in the click rate per minute that I was mentioning before. Now, a, fine, a, bit, a, bit, a few final notes. The first one about scale. To perform at the level that we saw or we keep seeing in other projects, um, in particular for StarCraft, each of the agents played 200 game years. That means playing 200 years non-stop StarCraft, which sounds pretty fun perhaps, but I'm not sure, you know? Um, I think OpenAI 5, which plays Dota 2, they mentioned this, a single agent played 450,000 years of Dota. So these numbers are pretty large. And so that's maybe one of the things that we should sort of think to fix or work on next in reinforcement learning. What happened next in the project, and which we you know, keep, keep tuned for news uh, fairly soon, is that we played um, more races than we played in January, and we went online and played against people kind of in the wild, which was a very fun experience. And we also kind of refine a bit sort of this fairness aspect. We introduced the camera, which humans have to deal with, and limited the actions per minute as well. And we announced this back in July, and results are sort of almost ready to be uh, released. So hopefully soon you get to see the news um, and you, you can remember my talk. So to conclude, um, this is quite important. I think to tackle real-world problems, um, we might still be a bit of few years away just because we need so much data. And the real problem here is these games can be simulated very fast on the data centers, but it might be quite hard to simulate the real world. In fact, it might be harder to simulate the real world than to create policies to act in the real world. And many people working on robotics, though, are working on creating simulate physics simulators and so on and so forth, which is quite exciting. Another challenge that I think is obvious here is that the Alpha Star agent, for instance, plays StarCraft very well, but it cannot play Atari games, although we know those games are quite simpler. So there's a kind of transfer learning issue in general in machine learning that I think we as researchers should start working on. And last but not least, this multi-agent distributed setup where the, there's no data set, it's just a non-stationary environment that keeps changing as you change how you interact with it, creates a few understanding and theory challenges. So with that, I think we do have a break. I'm very happy to have been the opportunity to give this talk, and obviously come and talk to me if you're interested in any of these topics. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.